So my name is Mike Giannotti, and I am a technical specialist on Microsoft Teams. I am your host today, but today I am joined by... Sam Brown. I'm also a Teams technical specialist, and I'll be your moderator. Yeah, so if you have questions, shout out. Sam is Sam's your person for that. And Pete Anello, also a voice technical specialist. And what are you doing? I'm the one who's giving the presentation today. He's going to talk. He's normally not this serious. Yeah. We'll get him off camera. <laughs> we'll lighten him up. So, again, a couple of uh, last minute pieces. Let me go ahead. We're going to pull over a view of our slides, some housekeeping items. Uh, the video is being brought to you by Logitech. I already ran through that. So, we're not going to repeat that. We want to get moving. A couple of pieces. Number one, if you have questions, ask. Ask, ask, ask. This is your time. We want to make sure you get your questions answered uh, today. So, you know, we love to engage and we have a whole team ready to do so. Next, all questions are moderated. They don't show up uh, for anybody until such time as Sam deems them worthy of publishing. So, you know, that way we can make sure that everything's appropriate, um, which I know you would love to do. And uh, finally, at the conclusion of today's session, we will be posting a recording from today, as well as any resources, to aka.ms slash HLS blog. That's aka.ms slash HLS blog. Last thing, if you are not seeing it, there is a Q&A panel. You can simply click in the upper right-hand corner. You'll see a little dialog box with a question mark. That will indicate that you can ask questions. Down below, your name is optional. You can put your name if you want or you can leave that and be anonymous. Post your questions. We'll be taking those, queuing those up. Pete will be pausing from time to time and answering them as we go. And with that, I'm gonna shut up and do it is all you. Thanks. So on to Pete Anello. Okay, thanks everyone. And again, you know, absolutely ask questions. Sam's right next to me. She can interrupt me if a good one comes through. Um, and this is really meant to be for you guys, so we're happy to, you know, deviate into some questions. But at a high level, I really, my goal was to keep the uh, agenda pretty simple because it is a complicated topic that most organizations are struggling with today. So one is I want to talk a little bit about why now, why are we doing this session today? You know, why, why, is, it, why is it relevant? Uh, a little technical background just to ensure, you know, everyone's sort of on the, the same technical footing uh, so everything makes sense as we go through the conversation. Um, simple transition using a phase approach, you know, I put, I put simple here in quotation marks because, you know, I recognize in most circumstances it's not simple to have a large upgrade within your environment. Uh, but we've come across, we've, we've developed uh, an approach that's simple, even though there's a lot of technical, complicated things on the back end. And then lastly, I'll share some real world examples that we created uh, through some customer workshops that we've done. So why now? Uh, this is just going to build it all out, right? It shows a lot of evolution that Microsoft has gone through since the introduction of LCS 2003. Some of you on this call might have actually installed LCS 2003. My first experience was LCS 2005. Um, and in 2007, my organization deployed uh, Enterprise Voice with Exchange UM on OCS 2007 R2. And I like to point that out because it really shows a lot of the evolution of the product. You know, Microsoft was really focused in on this unified communication space in the early days on the server platform. You know, then we brought Link 2013 along with Link Online, which in 2015 turned into Skype for Business. So up until now, you know, even though they have different names, there's been some core architecture that was the same with these systems. They were server-based infrastructures, and Microsoft was able to take those and develop Link Online, Skype Online. But in some ways, you know, that technology was built, you know, for a platform that was meant to be a server-based platform on an on-prem environment. We did a great job, in my opinion, a lot of success. 
Uh, you know, but it got to a point where, you know, we really had to look at, you know, if there's a better way of doing things. And we were able to take a lot of learnings uh, from the LCS to Skype days, whether it was the mobile experience, whether it was the web experience, the Mac experience, you know, the quality of experience that users have, et cetera, and take those lessons learned and basically implement a new system with teams that was built with the cloud in mind, cloud first. Um, take those lessons learned and be able to do things in a new and better and modern way. So why now, right in 2017, we did announce and you know we spoke with most of our customers and had a lot of communications that we that Teams would be ultimately the replacement for Skype for Business Online. But at that point, we were not ready to put any date out there. It would have been premature and honestly irresponsible for Microsoft to, you know, basically put something out there prematurely. Um, but on July 30th of this year, we did make that announcement that we are we have announced the end of life date for Skype for Business Online, which will be July 31st, 2021. So essentially. You know, two, you know, 23 months and counting. Uh, and I want to highlight that that is for online, not server, right? So for organizations that have invested in Skype for Business server, that same time frame does not apply to you, so you don't have to panic or worry. So that's why now, if, if I didn't make that clear. A uh, little technical groundwork. Uh, before I go, are there any questions that? Yes, yes, we have a couple uh, that are coming in. So the first one is, how can Teams be used to make ad hoc meeting calls to a person who's not already within a team site, like you can with Skype? For example, we do not currently have a team site set up. There's three of us, can either of you so, unless I'm remembering that, gotcha. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> uh, you should be able to do ad hoc, you know, calls within the multi-person chat. So I guess I'm not 100% sure of the scenario there. But if me, Mike, and Sam are having a group chat with one another, and we want to elevate that, we can. Like that. If you're not seeing it, maybe it's um, IT policy, perhaps. That's disabling some features, um, but you can definitely, you know, share your desktop, share applications, do an audio call, do a video call amongst the group. Cool. And the next one, how can I call an external contact with the team app if that external contact is still using Skype for Business? So that is a great question. That's Stephen. Yes. So in short, there is there is. Um, interoperability between the two. We will talk about that in a few slides down the road a little bit, um, but it, a lot of it has to do with what mode, the Teams mode that that user is. For instance, I'm a Teams only mode user here at Microsoft. I've been completely upgraded. Um, I'm able to chat freely um, with any federated um, you know, contact that I have, even if they're still running Skype for Business. Uh, and then Rajesh has whether the Teams group email address can be changed by default instead of adding it to mail contact. Mike, repeat that. That's so it. can the Teams group email address be changed by default instead of adding it to mail contact? For the actual team. No, not at this time. Cool. And then last one for now is how guest access can access the Teams channel SharePoint. So they set the access to guest approved and Azure admin portal, but they're not able to access it. So it, there's got to be something that's going on with again with your admin settings, because by default when you have guest access um, and I, in fact, I have confirmed this with a number of clients uh, who I'm doing. I'm invited as a guest and we have guests in uh, to ours as well. Uh, they they will have access to the underlying SharePoint for both uh, editing, consumption, and creation of content. And that is, it's not just through the file view, but they can actually open in SharePoint and see that view. If you're not seeing that, then there are additional settings that can be turned on 
um, through Azure Active Directory, where they can get very granular in restricting access and what people can and cannot do. Uh, therefore, you're going to have to go through those settings because that can vary wildly by organization to organization. So you want to make sure that they, you know, that you not inadvertently uh, restricted access where you didn't want to. Great. And the last question for that came from Roy, thanks for the question, is whether you will need to be off of Skype for Business Online by July 2021 and you will need to be completely off. Yeah, so. that, that's, a, that's an end of service date. So the, the planning and the work and the migration and all that stuff needs to happen before then. Great. Yeah. That's it for questions. For Great. Me. A uh, little technical groundwork, you know, what are the modes and why do I care? You know, we introduced five modes that control, you know, Teams client behavior and each one will affect your migration strategy. So we'll talk about those modes. We, we focus primarily on two, but we will hit on all five. Um, and the goal really is to keep this simple, you know, with your users having a positive experience because Really, for anyone who's been in IT for a fair amount of time, you know that if your users don't have a good experience, typically the project is not perceived as a success, right? Even if you did so many things right, if your users don't like it or have a bad experience, perception is in a lot of circumstances more powerful than reality, right? So the goal really in a lot of the, what we're gonna talk about is the user first. So the modes, there are five. We'll start with the islands mode. This is the default. This is when Skype and Teams run together simultaneously without any interoperability, hence the term islands. You can say ships in the night or whatever other term works for you. But the idea here is that there is no, there is no interoperability and users have both. They can do chat and calling within Teams and they can do meetings with the chat and calling within Skype or Teams, meetings within Skype or Teams, and they can take advantage of things like Teams and channels, right? And I put the little asterisk there because I really want to emphasize the point that there are a lot of really good granular policies that can allow administrators to control this, right? So if you're an organization, you say, hey, our network is not ready. We don't have the basic, you know, network requirements, environmental requirements, etc. You know, but I really, you know, I don't want people using real time voice, video, etc. because they're not going to have a bad experience. You can turn that off. Right. If you want users to be in islands mode, but only use Skype meetings to create meetings and only use Skype, you can manage that as well. They can join any meeting, but you can control it with it where they'll only join Skype. The next mode, and this is these are the two we will be focusing on, is teams only, and this is the final state. So this is really when your organization has made that complete um, uh, deployment of, of teams. You have a 100% deployment, large, large adoption, right? So this is totally the, the end state. Oops. The next one is Skype for Business, Teams, Collab, and Meetings. Historically, this was known as Meetings First. This is a very specific mode for organizations that have a large investment on on-prem Skype for Business voice. All right, so voice is a very heavy load to lift. All right, so if you tell an organization that is using our voice services on-prem, how you have to move the teams, that voice component is one of the most complicated elements, right? So a lot of organizations want to be able to take advantage of the goodness of teams, but leave the voice on-prem where it is for now. So this is a very specific mode that has a very specific use case, and that's why we won't focus on it much right here. Skype for business with teams collaborate. This is an alternate starting point. And this is an area where we typically have a lot of conversations with customers, whether it's islands mode or collab mode. 
The big difference with collab mode is that it actually takes any ability to have chat or meetings or all that stuff out of Teams, right? So the user can essentially have Teams, channels, they get that new net new collaboration goodness, but they don't get the chat and the calling. Now this is an ultimate starting point, but our experience to date has shown that this has actually not worked out as very well for a lot of organizations because we found that chat within Teams was one of the most important elements for user satisfaction with the tool, right? Because chat on web, chat on Mac, chat on the mobile, it's a really, really positive user experience. And when you take that away, the user engagement, the stickiness of that application is lost a little bit. There's other reasons why, you know, we found that this was a little complicated, a lot of trial and error with a lot of, a lot of customers. Um, it is a valid mode. Obviously, we made it for a reason, but really when it comes to a very simple approach, we really like to look at islands and teams only mode. The last mode is Skype for Business only, which essentially turns teams off minus meeting join capability, right? And this is the history behind this one really was early when we first brought teams in, into the tenants, organizations weren't ready to allow their users to use teams yet. And before we had the modes, the method to turn off teams for a user was to remove the license, right? Which is a little bit of a hack, right? So this is, this is a more graceful way to say, hey, these users aren't ready to go to teams yet. Just keep them on Skype. I don't want them using teams at all. But obviously in light with our announcement, Right, the idea of not giving user teams is really counterproductive and counterintuitive to our entire conversation here. So I don't think anyone would argue with me on this one not being a topic. Cool. Uh, so we have a lot of questions on these. Okay. So maybe we should pause here. Yep. Okay, so Celia from the University of Miami is asking, is there a way to use a Teams meeting in a channel, but also invite a resource calendar that's not a member of the team to that meeting? basically to allow a hybrid meeting of online and teams and in person in the conference room. Yes. Great. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and it's, as long as the resource, you know, you can you can look it up in your gal and let's say you know that your 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 Microsoft Teams team is going to have a physical gathering somewhere and you schedule the meeting through that team and you're in a room with like a hub. Right, or you're in a room with the Microsoft meeting room system, you can totally add those, add those to that, those meetings. Awesome. Okay, and another question, how long before we can assign numbers in the Teams admin portal instead of using the Skype? That is a great question, and I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately, for that one. Um, I will definitely try to take that as an action item to see if we can't let people know uh, maybe the time frame for when those air quotes legacy Skype tools go out of the legacy admin portal and go into the new portal. Um, we are working feverishly on that, so it's not going to be, you know, it, it's not going to be super long, but I don't have a detailed, I don't have a specific date that I can share right now. It's a good question though. Okay. And I feel your pain on that one too. So Chris uh, has a specific use case. He's running Skype with Enterprise Voice on site and has had quality issues in 2018 to move to teams with enterprise voice is a big chunk of change. What's the value or service guarantees that comes up um, with moving to teams with enterprise voice? Or is it just the cost of voice going up? So first of all, Chris, I absolutely encourage you to get together with your account team and have a deeper conversation on the return on investment for teams and voice. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, we can do to, you know, to help out in that, you know, in that capacity. Um, <clears throat> as far as, you know, what was the uh, yeah. SLA? And well, also the quality, right? They were having issues with the quality. So, so yeah, so the quality, there's, there's a couple things. One is, you know, Office 365, not just Teams, has a financially backed SLA, uh, which is a 3.9 SLA. Um, and, you know, if, if you were to have an outage that impacted you, you would work with your services team and have that identified and escalate appropriately and get whatever refunds you were, you were due, specifically to enterprise voice. If it's an IP phone, 
like physically an IP phone plugged into a cable, a team certified phone. There's a 4.9 SLA that you can monitor for those devices in the call quality dashboard. So you can see specifically how those devices do from a call quality perspective within your environment. But then and above and beyond that, quality is a huge, and that's, we'll talk about quality in a moment a little bit, but quality is a huge topic. And that's one of the reasons why we really talk about this phased approach for teams, because good quality is paramount to user happiness, right? So we have tools like Call Quality Dashboard, which we're releasing version three, uh, which is uh, public preview now, CQD teams.microsoft.com or cqd.admin. I have to look it up. But uh, really great can reports, uh, APIs for you to be able to export quality data into Power BI and the ability to create your own customized granular reports on quality is all within the tool. So when it comes to quality, one of the things that we highly recommend is when you go to Teams, you make sure that all of those prerequisites are taken care of. You know, you have your network readiness taken care of. You do your network assessment. You make sure your firewall ports are open. You make sure you have the appropriate bandwidth. But you also make sure your tools are pre-configured so you have that benchmark from when you start. Right? You can you can start to identify where your issues are, identify the root of those issues, and sort of strangle them out. So SLA, we have it. We have great tools. There are things that you need to do since it is a service. We don't run the service for you. You have to run the service. We need you to ensure that there are certain environmentals taken care of. Uh, and when it, call, when it comes to the cost analysis, I would, I would recommend talking to your account team. Great. Uh, we actually have a question about uh, the US versus Canada. So. What's the plan for migrating organizations that have Teams data residency in North America, but Skype for Business data residency in Canada data centers before end of life? That, that, that stumps me off the top of my head. We'll have to take that one. Unless you know, Mike, I, I don't know. Repeat that. Yeah, so the plan for migrating organizations that have their Teams data residency right now in North America, but then Skype. Data yeah, I mean, we opened up the Canada data centers, but we don't have that exact information. I would talk with your team, your account team on that to, to be able to, because that's going to be on a case by case basis. Not all necessarily. Remember, it's we're talking around, this is around data residency, our local data centers within nationalities, and not everybody even who's in Canada, for example, will necessarily have their data moved to Canada. So I have customers, Pete, we all, all three of us here do, where we have customers that are multinational, but that doesn't mean that all of them have data residing in, you know, necessarily the different uh, countries of record. There are specific service offerings around that where there is a need for that data residency. So that would be something you'd need to be talking to your account team on. Great. And do all Teams users need to be on the same Teams mode? No. Great question. Mode is at the user level or tenant level. And for and, and just to add to that, it's not a hard cut. Like if you you want to test and put yourself, if you're an IT admin, you want to put yourself in Teams mode for you know a day or a week, you can do that and switch back to Islands mode. So it's not it's not a hard cut. Great. Thanks for the question, Tyler. And Rajesh is asking, they're in islands mode once they change to Teams only mode, uh, whether the Skype chat and meeting will be synced to Teams by default. So when you're in when you're in Teams only mode, there is no more Skype chat. At that point, it's gone. So if a team if if you're in islands mode, and I'll show this in a few slides, if you're in islands mode and someone else is in Teams only mode, and you, I am the Teams only person from from Skype. They're going to receive it in Teams, and it'll show them, hey, you know, Mike just I am you, but it's Skype. For a better conversation, go to Teams. And from Stephanie, thanks for the question. Is it possible to limit access for guest users to specific channels within a team? Mike. 
guest I'm access. answering somebody else's oh, question. Yeah. What is is it possible to limit access for guest, user, guest users to specific channels within a team? To limit them to, so yeah, so real quick, this is how that works. So we are, we've already announced and it's in preview, uh, actually coming out of preview, private channels. However, having said that, this is the issue that you have to consider. In order to be added to a private channel, you first have to be a part of the broader general channel. Once you're a part of the broader general channel, which can be just a broad based informational piece, you can then restrict them to individual channels within that given team. So the, the stipulation is you have to be a part of the broader one, the general channel, then you can restrict users through um, that those secure channels to those specific ones. You cannot, however, add somebody only to a specific channel. They first have to be a part of the general. So that's kind of the sticking point there. So that if you're planning on having people, you know, you have a broad kind of just entry level where everybody can see, you know, general announcements, et cetera. But then for their specific work they're doing, you can then secure those channels and only allow them access to those where, where you'd like them. Great. All right. Uh, the next one, it looks like Mike answered one of them uh, directly. So if we do know the answer, we are putting it into the chat. But for the next one live, uh, we're using Skype for Business integration with Skype Consumer, which allows HR folks to leverage internal tool interviewing some candidates remotely that regularly use Skype. Yep. Does Teams support it? And if not, are there any plans to add that in the future? Uh, today, no, but yes, by, I, I'm pretty sure I'll double check uh, end of the year. We, we announced that in the same team's blog post where we announced the Skype for Business end of life. It was one of the feedbacks we got from a lot of our customers saying they use it in that scenario or they have road warrior salespeople who use it to communicate with their family, etc. So yeah, it's, it's not there today, but it's definitely, it's definitely there coming. Awesome. Uh, the next one is, it looks like Skype for Business Online has a sunset date, but is there any plan to sunset Skype for Business on print? And if so, do we have any ideas for the dates? No, no dates. I mean, you see, we just released the latest version of Skype for Business server, so that'll go through our normal support process for servers. Um, as of right now, I can't say honestly if there will be another server version or not. Um, but as of right now, there is no end of life for a Skype for Business server. Uh, and like I said, we just released server 2019. So we have, you know, the newest and latest bits out there now. Um, so if organizations are running on-prem, they, they have a much longer runway than the organizations that are online. And Joe has a question about flow. So he blocks Office 365 group team creation in their tenant. Is there any flow or workflow you suggest for users to request new teams that would allow them some governance? Yeah, that's a great question. That's that's a big question. Um, and that is that is a very large question that we get um, from lots of our customers. Yeah, I would take a look. So we have a, a post on HLS, aka.ms slash HLS blog. There is a post on there that uh, recording I did with uh, Mike McKellen and uh, Bruce Weaver, yeah. where they go through actually invoking, leveraging the graph, uh, Microsoft Flow, yeah. and a process whereby they grant or do not grant the ability to have guest access at a team by team level. But they walk through kind of showing you how they did that and, and the process. So that it absolutely can be set up. If you're not comfortable doing it yourself, certainly partners or um, services can do so. And there are also third party solutions such as AvPoint that invoke the exact same pieces on the back end, abstract it, make it simple, and let you set that up. Uh, and just to add to that, the, the work that, that Bruce and, and Mike did with the webcast that the, the other Mike presented, um, it, it is a no code solution, right? And I, you know, I have no coding background and I was able to follow it. And, and understand it and be able to implement it as well. So um, it would be nice if there's something in the admin center to be able to control that, right? Um, but the solution that we've come up with actually works quite well. 
And Robert has a couple questions. Thank you, Robert. Uh, how can teams be used to make ad hoc meeting calls to a person who's not already within a team site like you can with Skype? So uh, I, I, so if Robert's listening, let me know whether I'm talking about the exact same thing. Are you talking about the meet now button that you have within the Skype business client? We're gonna have a little delay. I'll let Robert <laughs> answer that one, but if he is, uh, if that is what he's talking about, uh, you're right. There is not there is not that same meet now button that spins up the audio conferencing grid with all the details like you see within Teams and Channels. But that that is also coming within uh, the the private chat um, view as well. Okay. So if you're looking, if that's what you're looking for, that meet now comparison, um, that that that's that's roadmap that's coming. While we're waiting on Robert, see if that answers his question. He's asking, how can I call an external contact with the Teams app if that external contact is still using Skype for business? So that's a great question, Robert, and that again goes down to the moats. And I'll talk on that a little bit, but you know, really at a high level, um, it all it all what that works. The engineering bits are in, but it really boils down to the mode that you're in and the mode that your user that you're communicating is in. The contact. Okay. All right, and we have a couple more coming through right now. So Joe is asking if we can send a link to the HLS blog. Absolutely, we'll have that in the slides as well. And then we just have one more question, then we're gonna keep going with uh, Pete's presentation here. Do you know if there is a possibility in Teams, like in Skype for Business, with response groups to give specific rights to an end user to manage only an auto attendant, for example, exceptionally like open and close a reception outside default business hours. Is uh, if I'm understanding the qu question correctly, yes, uh, with call queues and auto attendant, we can we can address that scenario outlined, um, but the devils in the details on that one. Cool. All right, let's go ahead and keep moving forward. Okay, uh, a couple of things I just want to highlight here because I did make them bold and it, it kind of, you know, jives with the story I'm trying to tell. Um, for these three bottom uh, modes, the calling, chat, client, and Skype for business. So that means chat is not there in the Teams. And we receive a lot of feedback from customers that losing that chat uh, was it? a disadvantage to the to the users. So islands mode, right? So two ships in the night, they run side by side. You know, users can do chats on either side. They can do VoIP on either side if depending on your policy. Admins can control calling policy. Um, you can control it, you know, so there's you know no Teams app there if you don't want the Teams app. So it's only the Skype for Business app. Um, there are granular mechanisms, mechanisms that can control how users leverage Teams meetings. And you'll see in a minute why I, why I, why I bring this up. But my point being is that Islands mode coupled with policies can pretty much give you everything you want without going to one of those other modes. Um, here, a couple things to note. Um, when you're in Islands mode, um, mobile and OWA meeting creation stays Skype for business, right? So if you're using Outlook Mobile and you create a meeting on that Outlook Mobile device, if you're in Islands mode, it's going to be Skype for business. The other thing is for enterprise voice users, for users, Skype users who are using Skype as their actual telephone, any inbound PSTN call will stay in Skype. And similarly, if you're a federated organization, you have external contacts, regardless what mode they are on, if you're in islands mode and an external person chats with you, you're going to receive it in Skype because Skype in islands mode is the default inbound calling and the default inbound chat client. And we do it that way so we can turn on islands mode within your organization and it doesn't break how Skype for business works today. Right, it doesn't impact your users' Skype experience or how they do things. Teams only mode, right? This is this is where you go when your organization is fully deployed. 
when you have a you know great adoption because what's going to happen is if you put someone in teams only mode and they try to i am someone who's in islands mode who doesn't have teams installed or doesn't have teams up and running doesn't have anywhere to go and then they'll receive a note in email saying hey you're you're missing out all the fun in teams so this is one of the reasons why we really emphasize the saturation of teams before you go to islands mode because you want to make sure that when your ceo or your vp looks someone up to communicate with them that they're there because if they look them up and they're offline or they say hey sam i keep on i am you in teams and you never reply and sam's like hey i don't have it right then that that's not a good scenario so that's why teams only mode is at the very end once you go to teams only mode that's when your inbound pstn calls will start to ring your team's client and that's also when those external federated people who i am you you'll receive it in teams at that point right so customer x i am me i'm in islands mode i'm going to receive it in skype customer x i am me after i've been into teams only mode i'm going to get it in teams a couple of small things to identify there. First time user logs in to Teams, that's when their existing Skype contacts are migrated over to te Teams. So your Skype my contacts migrate over minus the external people because all of that stuff stays in Skype for business until you upgrade. But when you go to Teams only mode, that process will also update your contacts. So if you've created any new contacts between the time you logged into Teams for the first time and the time you get upgraded, that upgrade process will go through and bring all those contacts over. This is something, I, so this, this gives you guys a visual, I meant to point it out on the modes slide, but the policy that you have the modes, you can actually create a notification and you'll you see that here. Right, so you can, you're gonna upgrade users two months time, I mean, two weeks time. You can say, hey, stay in islands mode, but set notify to true. That way when the user logs into Skype for business, they say, hey, you're gonna be upgraded to team soon. You wanna give it a try, a tryout. And then the one on the right, this shows when a user's teams only, when they upgrade, when they try to log into Skype for business, what the client shows them. And another thing about the Teams only mode, it also, you know, Outlook meeting add-in for Skype gets removed. Skype for Business integration with Office is disabled and Teams is enabled. And your Outlook contact cards within Outlook, obviously, are mapped to Teams at that point. So if you're like me and you like to right-click a user's little jelly bean icon and to send an IM message, when you go to Teams only, that'll automatically have the Outlook suite change that to send it to Teams instead of instead of Outlook. I mean, Skype. So we do have a couple of uh, logistical questions with the migration. So Rod is asking, do the attendance and call queues move to Teams seamlessly? Yes, one from the pretty much from your perspective, it's one and the same. And then will the ability to record meetings still be an option regardless of the mode? Yes, the ability to record, record meetings is uh, a native Teams meeting experience regardless of the mode. But that again also is controllable by policy. So if you wanted a group of individuals to not have that ability, you can totally say, hey, you know, this group over here, I don't want them to be able to record. And some people have asked a couple of questions about uh, our recommended migration path, and that's something that Pete's going to hit on in a couple of slides, so don't think we're ignoring your questions. Uh, feel free to follow up after we get there. And last one for now is Mario's asking, will Teams eventually have the same meeting capabilities that Skype for Business meeting presenters have, being able to mute? Absolutely, Mario. Absolutely, this is a big ask. I can't wait for it. Um, what we have right now, I, I think it's general, generally available, is the uh, per meeting controls for lobby capability that's there today. And we are bringing attender and presentee controls to Teams, uh, Teams meetings. So I'm surprised that's the first 
time we got that question today because it is a really big deal to a lot of customers and, and yes it's coming in i don't have uh, exact dates but it's coming uh soon i'll do air quotes soon great all right let's keep pushing forward oh cool so this is, I wanted to show you guys a little bit of the user experience, um, just because, you know, this is part of the, uh, the technical foundations. When you have users in Teams only mode, that's when you force that interoperability, because if I'm Islands mode and Samantha's Teams only, she only has Teams. That's the only platform she can communicate with me, right? So in this circumstance, you know, Adele sends Enrico a note and it says, hey, this person's on Skype. And Skype says, hey, they're, they're on Teams, right? And then there's this little option to invite um, Adele to have that conversation in, in Teams instead of Skype. So right here, this is the interop between uh, Teams only and Islands mode. But the idea is that you don't have to leverage the interop, right? We, we give these the, the display coach marks to help inform users that you're on a disparate platform. And since everyone is in islands mode, Enrique can totally talk to Adele and Teams. Right, so right here, they can just say, hey, uh, nope, we're going to Teams, forget this interrupt stuff. They, they didn't want to do that. You know, we do have calling interrupt capability, you know, so you can do you can do the one-to-one -one calling. Um, and then this, this is actually different. So this says, you know, sharing, you know, from a call uh, up until I think it might be GA today, it's going to be released any day if it's not released already. Uh, desktop sharing in our app wasn't supported between Skype for Business and Teams, but in part of the feedback we've gotten from our customers and to help, um, to help with this transition, the ability to do sharing uh, desktop sharing between Skype and Teams in an interrupt capacity uh, is coming to fruition. And I, I think it's I think it's GA now, but if it's not now, it's going to be in just like a matter of like days, dates or weeks. So I put that up there for you all to see, but you know, this is one of the areas that we're actually, this is gonna be, this is technically not applicable because we're changing it. But I really wanted to show you guys the idea of these display coaches because when everyone is in islands mode and then you bring someone to teams only and you force that interrupt, it just gives them that mechanism to elevate that conversation directly to teams. So now we're going into, you know, guidance on how to do it, right? And Mike and I, you know, we spent a lot of time over the past two years speaking with customers on how to do just that. And over the past year, we've really found a formula that has worked very, very well. Um, and, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. This, this is the result of real practical experience in the world. So I put this slide up first because it's very high level. And really, I want to emphasize the simplicity of it. Um, the idea really is, you know, to come up with a base approach you have your two modes. We went through the modes, keep it nice and simple, two modes, that's it. You know, but a lot of organizations, when we talk to them and we say, hey, you need to roll out teams, they say, well, my network isn't ready. My room systems aren't ready, right? I don't have enough, I don't, my users aren't trained yet. Ripping and replacing is always a pain. You know, there's a whole list, a litany of reasons on why organizations have a hard time deploying teams at a broad scale and they're legitimate. But what we found the hardest workload to lift in teams was the unified communications portion of it because there's a lot of network considerations, hardware considerations, environmental considerations, etc. And this was becoming a real stumbling block for organizations to get immediate benefit from the chat and core collaboration, i.e. teams and channels within teams. So we said, okay, hey, this first phase, let's focus on the net new stuff, right? Stuff our users don't have yet, stuff that we can get some immediate value from right now, focus on that and give ourselves runway 
to be able to accomplish the more complicated workloads like calling and voice and meetings, right? So the goal really is to get it out there, get some quick wins, have some success, and then through controlled mechanism, start releasing more and more advanced features. The other thing that we've really found here is that if you put calling and meeting and everything in that first phase and you start talking to users about taking Skype away, then you're talking to users about taking something away, right? And, that, and then it's it, it's more arduous transition process. We found that if users start with chat and collab, they become familiarized with it. Moving to meetings is a natural evolution, right? And then you know, by the time you get towards the end of phase two, it's it's not about removing Skype, right? It's 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 already sort of happened naturally and organically, and users have those behaviors in Teams now instead of Skype. So it tempers them, it gives them an opportunity to transition without too much too much change at once. So quick intro into the phases. Um, so these phases aren't necessarily cut and dry. You, you know, you could come up with three, you could come up with five, a little bit will depend on your organization, but the, the ultimate framework is the same, right? Obviously you guys have to pilot, become familiarized with it as an organization, site security, governance, compliance, you know, IT, et cetera. Um, and then phase one was really about, you know, getting the client deployed, and focusing on that core collaboration. Phase two, we found a lot of success with line of business and third-party app integration. Um, you know, you know, ServiceNow, for instance, is, is a good one. Um, you know, a lot of organizations have created, you know, customized, you know, training material for Teams or for their us users. They'll publish that within Teams and make it a tab and actually put it right in the Teams client. Meeting and calling, again, that those other two phases are really to give you runway to work on those heavier workloads, right? Takes a lot of network planning, a lot of resource planning, a lot of, you know, room systems, etc. And then the final phase is migration. So pilot. Most orgs have piloted by now, but if you haven't, get going. I would like to invoke Henry Rollins. <laughs> don't think about it, don't talk about it, do it. Um, not to make light of the Herculean task a lot of organizations have in front of them to make this shift. I understand there are a lot of moving parts. You know, if you looked at UC 10 years ago, you had to bring telephony groups, network groups, system groups together. And that was sometimes challenging because these technologies were starting to converge. And now you look at Teams, Teams covers everything, right? So that's why I'm a team specialist, Mike's a team specialist, Sam's a team specialist, but Mike is a SharePoint ninja and I'm much stronger on the voice side, right? So even at Microsoft, our, our, our teams have merged to reflect how the technology is presented to the users. So I recognize there's a lot of challenges within organizations to do it, but really, entitled for Office 365. You already have it. It's part of your entitlements and you can take advantage of it. And the nice thing with some of the policies that we've implemented and then one of the newest policies is the application permissions policy is that previously if you wanted to implement applications in your tenant, it was an org wide setting. On or off, very binary. And most organizations said, screw that, right? I can't. I can't open this up. My security team is going to have my hide. My boss will kill me. That permissions policies are now now allow us to turn it on at the tenant level, but only enable it to specific users or groups of users. Right. So if you have a third party app previously, if you wanted it in your tenant, it was there. Kind of wild west. Now you can actually say, hey, you know, I only want R&D to have this particular application. Or maybe I want IT to have all applications because they, they need to know what's going on, but that can go over there gets done. So get going, pilot it, make sure you get your appropriate stakeholders involved. Uh, 
my success in IT has been with the strength of good project management always. So this is the time where you get your project managers involved as well to make sure that you have the appropriate sponsorship and you have the appropriate plans and the appropriate resources. And by the way, this picture of Henry Rollins is like 30 years old. <laughs> so if Henry's listening, sorry, man. <laughs> but before we go there, uh, some questions? Yes, we have three more questions. So from David, will restricted users be able to install Teams without IT provisioning an admin password? Do you want me to? Yeah. Yeah. So um, if we're talking about restricted access on the desktop where people cannot provision applications, we don't go around IT. If you're already restricting where you have to be a user or admin, then, you know, of course, you can push it out uh, with methods like you might be doing today, SECM and others. Um, but we're not going to go around that. So if they do not have admin access to be able to install apps on their desktop, they're still not going to be able to. We don't, I think IT would string us up if uh, we didn't uh, provide that. The other piece, and I see Pete's drawing on his face. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the other, you know, the other piece is, again, if you already have a process in place where you go in, you know, with a service account into the machines to push out uh, applications, you'll be able to do that to download and install the application. So nothing changes. And I can, uh, I can show what the application policy, the permissions policy looks like as well. It might give David a better idea. But that is in the, under app policies, that is in that modern portal. So the, I have a couple of these. This one is my favorite. Um, the next couple are actually, you know, derived from one, two, three day workshops with customers. You know, where we sat down and say, okay, you know, from A to Z, this is where we need to be, this is where we're at, what are all the things that we need to think about? Um, this particular session was great. We had all the important um, uh, IT leadership participated, right? So everyone who was going to exact, essentially have a role to play uh, was there and able to have their input. And we basically went through and said, okay, here we're at today, this is where we want to go. You know, we have a six month window and what do we need to do? How do we get there, right? So phase one at the top, you see chat and collaboration, but really, you know, this is about getting, getting your environmentals in order, getting your infrastructure taken care of, making sure you have governance lined up, security lined up, focus on adoption, change management campaigns, get your users, excited you know why should they be using teams they already have skype they already have SharePoint. they already have all this other stuff why is this particular application going to benefit them you know so that's a lot of the work that goes into those early stages you know it's, it's getting it out there it's getting people excited and it's really identifying those core requirements that you need for team to be successful and you know some of these things in this list i think will resonate with a lot of the questions received around know governance etc right so that's really where you start off you can see operational readiness is never ending neither is the ongoing campaigns right um we i, I left windows 7 in here to to 10 you know windows 10 8 gig uh, i did put the hardware requirements really the point with this one is if you have a windows 7 machine with two gigs of memory that's bulging at the seams already Adding any hardware, any software to it is going to have an adverse effect, not, not just Teams, right? But you want to make sure that the hardware you have is appropriate because, again, it's, it's about having your users have good experience. Phase two, again, we've had a lot of success using Flow, Power Apps, third party integrations, creating custom apps, connectors, et cetera to bring all of those various line of business, third party applications that users are using all over the place. And you have ugly bookmarks, you know, that are three years old, but some of them stale. Bring it into, you know, you can implement it and extend it into Teams where that becomes that single interface for your users to be able to take advantage of those capabilities. So we've had a lot of good, quick, easy successes 
with this line of business application, third party application integration. So Dustin's gotten a like on his question, so we should probably address it. When a user is moving to Teams only mode, will they still be able to join legacy Skype for Business meetings using the full client or just the web app? That's a great question, and it's either. And you as IT administrators can control that. You know, so within that Teams mo only mode policy, you can say, hey, I want this group of users to only use the web app, or hey, they already have it installed. Let it let it stay there, relegated to the meeting joint experience only. So that's that that is the flex that, that flexibility within the organization. I can tell you my personal experience. Um, Skype web app can be a little bit cumbersome sometimes, and that's why with Teams we went to a, a pluginless web experience. Um, that said, you know, Microsoft has left Teams on my machine. I still, I'm sorry, Skype, I still have it on my machine. It runs there dormant and it will launch when my meeting starts. We have that full rich experience. Me, personally, I do the web always now. Just because I'm so accustomed to just being in Teams, when I click that Skype join button, I might shrug a little bit because it's not a Teams meeting, uh, but then I'll I'll just join it from the web, you know. So, but you know, it's so that that long-winded way of saying you have control as an IT admin, but your users will also have their preference that works for them. Uh, and then the next one is for UC environments. What about people using CCEs? So that is a great question, and it is a little bit outside the scope of what I prepared here shifting from the CC infrastructure, CCE infrastructure to direct routing. But Mike, that's probably a good additional webcast in the future, shifting CCE. We can include uh, some documentation we have around, around it. You know, because it is well documented. We've done a pretty good job documenting transitioning from CCE to direct routing. It's pretty straightforward in reality, you know, especially if you have an SPC that's already supported for direct routing, you know, that's on the, you know, tied into your CCE, um, then it's a matter of SPC configuration and user configuration, but there, there is a direct, relatively painless path to do it. Alex, Alex is saying, doesn't Teams client install in the user directory and doesn't require an admin? Yeah, and I responded directly back. To oh, great. That if you know, the the point is this: if if you there are organizations that lock down the laptop period, so it can't users can't install anything. We're not going around that, and we've now also announced inclusion into the office suite. So um, you'll be seeing that where you can just handle it like you would other office apps. And just to go back to the CCE again, you know, that would be that would be a phase three activity, you know, according to sort of this methodology, right? You're in islands mode phase one, you're in islands mode phase two. You're getting all of that planning together for that CCE migration during those phases, right? So that when it comes to phase three, phase four, you have all of that planning done, you have it all buttoned up. Assuming you know you tested it, you feel good about it, and you're ready to go. You're locked and loaded. So that's one of the reasons why, again, that voice is that's that's the heavy duty stuff, right? And I really emphasize, you know, um, network preparedness, right? I have here, you know, Microsoft Teams room readiness, but it's not just Teams room. You know, we have meeting rooms in general, right? Lots of organizations have investment in, you know. Cisco or all over the place. So how do you how do you leverage those those air quotes legacy rooms into your team's meetings? You know, what do you do for a new room standard with MTR? You know, what kind of network preparedness do you have enough bandwidth? You know, so phase one allows you to get the client out there. Chat is very lightweight. Get it out there, get users using it. Good get good good gain. And those things that require more runway, like that voice stuff, you know, we can sort of push down 
blue. The idea here really is to get value immediately, right? Like how can we get value right away? And when we have those conversations, they turn into conversations about the network. They turn into conversations about, you know, room systems and things along those lines. And those are the real hard part. So it's about getting value today. And Mario noticed that the meeting icon on the left sidebar of Teams changed to calendar. Is there going to be a Teams calendar option? They mean within the team yeah. itself. Yeah. So, yeah. so real quick, if you want to have the group calendar for your team displayed within the team, I'll refer you back to our blog, aka.ms slash HLS blog. Uh, the reason why I say that, I have a step-by-step -step post from several weeks ago. You'll see it um, to show you how to accomplish that. Awesome. All right, let's keep it going. And Keith, absolutely, virtual SBCs are cool. Post them in Azure. Uh, just make sure they're configured appropriately, um, inspect out appropriately, but absolutely. And, and honestly, we're seeing a lot of customers put those SBCs in Azure. It doesn't have to be in Azure, right? If it's virtual, it's in your own data center with Azure. Azure works as well. Great. And then uh, do we have any recommendations with tweaking security software installed on many corporate desktops today? Uh, you mean like uh, antivirus software? Yeah, they're saying that they see that the antiviral software seems to slow down the systems and the UC experience. Yeah, so I've heard I don't have specific guidance on how to resolve that. Um, I mean, obviously we're Microsoft and, you know, Sarah, I would ask if you're having that problem with Defender. Um, but yeah, we, we have seen that and typically um, in the past there have been inappropriate exclusions, right? You have to exclude certain types of certain types of uh, you know, files from being scanned, but I don't have any specific teams guidance. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to come down to your antiviral. There's a whole bunch of different ones out there. Certainly ours is made to work with it. Uh, if you're using another third party, um, then it's going to be a case by case basis and you're going to have to look at where it's impacting and, and the specific guidance for that. And I would refer to the vendor then in that case. And last one for now, Stephanie has recurring meetings in Outlook, and she's wondering if the links still function if they move to Teams only mode. It's a great question. So they, so right now, yes, they'll absolutely still function. They will stay Skype. So you'll use your your Skype client or the web client to join them, and you know just like everyone else, um, we are working on a meeting migration tool for Teams. So after your users get moved, IT administrators can uh, run a tool that will basically update all of those reoccurring or future meetings and make them Teams meetings. It also work with Skype, but the meeting migration services is on in the works. So one of the things I just want to emphasize uh, before I show you a couple other samples, which I won't go into in detail, I just wanted to show you the different types of results we've had with some of these workshops, is that phase three, at this point, users will have all of the same functionality in Teams than they had in Skype at that point. So if you if they weren't doing meetings, if they, you know, you were disabling, you know, voice. You know, phase three is really getting all of those other advanced features out there when you're ready. But the idea is since you've already had phase one and phase two and your users have been using it, you've had these ongoing, you know, campaigns, these, you know, <clears throat> communications, et cetera, is not about taking Teams uh, Skype away, right? It's not about needing Skype anymore. So the idea at this point is, you know, you'll start to just see naturally your team's usage is going to go up in your environment and your Skype usage is going to go down naturally, right? And that's what you want because as soon as you rip and replace with users, that's when they get grumpy. I love 
love touchscreen. <laughs> So I won't go with it in this one in detail. Um, you know, this deck will be available uh, for you guys to have afterwards and, and peruse at your leisure. Uh, but really, you know, this is just a different view of essentially the same concept, right? Which is get the client out there. You know, if you need to restrict a few things while you're getting your network ready, your, your you know, your, your adoption and your training and all that kind of stuff, you do that and you keep yourself runway. You focus on some maybe some easy wins with line of business apps and bots, right? You might have a couple, this particular customer external collaboration was a big deal with them. They really wanted to get it in the time frame. But as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of governance and security concerns associated with allowing external, external participants into your meetings, right? So this would be customized according to your needs of your organization, but it's just another example of essentially taking a phased approach. And this is enough. This is just another sample, you know, from an end user perspective when they can start seeing. And this again, this was this was the result of, you know, one and a half, two day sessions with customers to really understand their detailed specific needs and you know, the things that were important to them and help them come up with a, plat, a path that they can you know, present to their executive leadership and say, hey, yep, we need to get there. Yep, we know how to do it. And this is how we're going to do it and articulate it in a way that doesn't make, you know, people's eyes glaze over. Uh, so we have a question on notify Skype for business users. Could that be set for Skype for business on-premise users? So all of the modes besides Teams only work for on-prem. So yes. And Matt, thanks for the question. Uh, have Teams APIs been released to call center manufacturers? No, roadmap by end of year. Good question, Matt. <laughs> Andrew's asking, Dellwise thin clients that are connected to virtual desktops don't support Teams video and offloading today, but do you have clients following the space approach while they wait for the support to come? So I don't know about I don't know about support for uh, the Dell product in particular. Um, but you know from a from a phase perspective, you definitely could create policies for those users that um, disabled the real time uh, portion of, of Teams, so they would essentially use chat and Teams and channels within their client. Um, Citrix is the only supported platform right now, and we're working with uh, our own BDI will be supported shortly. All right, that's all the questions we have. Great. Uh, real quick, just to show you guys, but again, you'll have the deck. Um, this today's session was just a continued effort by Microsoft to help educate and support our customers move to Teams, right? Uh, Sam, Mike, and I, it's pretty much all we do. And there's a lot of us that that's all we do. Um, and we focus specifically directly with our customers face to face, uh, more one to many like this. But Microsoft as a whole is working on a lot of resources uh, to help organizations do that transfer, right? So I won't drain this, but the ado adoption toolkit is pretty awesome. I totally recommend people go and download it today and look at it. Um, but, you know, we see we have the roadmap, upgrade guidance, knowledge, um, some additional resources here as well, which has the Teams tech community blog, which is my next to the healthcare blog my favorite blog. Um, my favorite thing is month, they do monthly updates with everything that's been released uh, for teams for that past month. Um, and then you can also see there's some, some pretty good training materials and these two are all online and free, the IT readiness and user training. And the IT readiness, it covers things from direct routing to network readiness, et cetera. It's really, really quite good uh, video with PowerPoint, which I hate PowerPoint, but I think as a learning tool, it's really quite good. 
And these are some links that I put in from some of the things that I mentioned today. You know, we talked about the meeting policy, so you can turn on or off specific meeting features, including the ability to create meetings while you're in islands mode. Um, calling policy to you know control calling while you're in islands mode. App setup and app permissions policy. So I'll just show those two real quick. And while we're waiting, there was a question asked about fast track uh, assistance. There is fast track assistance with Teams. Yes. I meant to bring that up. Thanks. <laughs> Whoever asked that, I owe you one. Because <laughs> it was totally on my bank dues. So we have the app setup policy. You know, real quick, what that does is, um, you know, you can say, hey, I called this one UC for Unified Communications because I'm super original. This person will only see these three tabs when they log into Teams. So the app setup policy will actually control the, the tabs on the left side of the UI when the user logs in. So these are really nice and convenient because you might have a, um, you know, maybe it's a training application, you know, that you want all users to have access to. It doesn't have to be a Microsoft app. It can totally be a third party custom app and you can pay it to every user or a group of users uh, start menu in Teams and that way it becomes a permanent fixture for them. Um, that permission policy, this one, this was a hallelujah moment for me. This is like when the <laughs> Mario asked about the attender, attendee presenter controls. That's another like hands in the air uh, moment. So you can see here, this is a policy that I said, okay, when the Microsoft apps allow apps and block all others. So you see I have a couple options there. I can block them all. But the idea here is, you know, if you look in the app store for Teams, there's so many apps, right? And you can't, I mean, you can't vet them all for one, right? Um, this allows you to start turning some of those things on in your tenant and then have controlled granular access of which individuals have access to those applications. So this is a real big, uh, this has been a big ask for a lot of organizations for a long time because typically, and Mike will tell you, we've been pretty candid, new to teams, new to organizations, turn off third party apps, turn off side loading of apps. Like we would be pretty candid to say, just turn that off. This allows you to turn them on but turn on malicious script. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This allows you to turn them on at a tenant level, but then trickle them out to your to your users. So this one you can see same for third party and, and tenant apps. So you can create your own custom apps, bring in your third parties, and start to create permissions policies that will that allow you to dictate who can actually leverage that app or not. Couple more general questions. Roy wants to know the dependencies on Exchange. Can you roll out Teams UC without Exchange? It, team, so there's a whole article on how Teams relies on Exchange. But the short of it is, if you want calendar functionality, Teams uses Exchange EWS free uh, availability services. So all the calendar, all of your free busy stuff, all of that stuff gets pulled in from Exchange and 2016 on-prem or online. Might be Service Pack 3 2016. Yeah. There's a Service Packer. Yep. Okay. And Dave's asking how many of our organizations have made the change fully to Teams. For that's, that's a great question. I actually don't have a specific uh, number on how many organizations. Um, and in addition to that, we do take our customers' security and privacy extremely seriously. That said, I can tell you anecdotally that Mike, Sam, and I are responsible for the healthcare of life sciences organizations on the Northeast Coast. We have around 140 customers from the biggest of the big to, to pretty big. And we have a handful of customers that have already communicated to their users that they will be teams only. You know, one, one in particular I'm thinking of, 50 plus thousand user organization, they'll be teams only, completely shifted from Skype this time next month. 
to be very candid where we are in the life cycle of the product, we're in, for a lot of our larger customers, we're in phase three, right? We're seeing great, great adoption. A lot of it is islands mode with focusing in on getting the teams only mode. But teams only mode is last year was all about getting it ramped up, which we kind of crushed it last year. And this year is all about I can answer Keith's question. <laughs> so this year, so last year, just to finish that thought, last year was really, we spent a lot of time getting organizations prepared and the fruit of that labor is paying off now. And now we're seeing organizations start to make that switch. And we're hoping to have some public case references soon. And if anyone on this line is doing it and they want to be a case reference, let us know. So what do, What's this I hear about Polycom VBX 500 is not supported on Teams? That is true, Keith. None of the VBX phones are supported on Teams. Uh, the old 3PIP IP phones that were certified for Skype for Business are not certified for Teams. Um, there's a couple of reasons why that is. You know, it, uh, at a high level, native Teams phones actually run Droid, um, Droid mobile software with um the actual teams client that has been engineered to be a phone on that device so whether you buy a polycom device or a crestron phone or a yaling phone you know they all have their individual flavors and merits but from the user interface it's going to be exactly the same from the management it's going to be exactly the same and that's really important for users we got a lot of feedback from our customers that hey i'm Polycom phone, and then I have an audio codes phone, and they're both great, but I'll go one to the other, even though Skype's on the back end, it's a completely different user experience. So there's that, coupled with when we first started with those phones, we were still server based. Updates would come out every six months, 12 months, 18 months, three years. And we essentially gave our partners a bunch of APIs and some guidelines to say, here are the APIs, here are the guidelines, go do what you want. With the cloud, and especially with Teams, candidly, it's hard for all of our hardware partners to, to stay at the same speed of ingenuity that we are at with Teams, right? So there's sort of two reasons on why we did it that way, right? Now, about them being unsupported, um, there are two things to keep in mind. One, uh, Skype end of life is July 2021. Those VVX phones will work for Teams through a SIP gateway that Microsoft has implemented in our cloud that will allow it to work for Teams. It won't, it might not have every single bell and whistle you would expect, but it'll, it'll work. That gateway will be open, will be maintained until uh july 2023 so four years from now um is when that gateway is scheduled to be end of life so for the next four years bbx phones or any three pit phones will be able to work with teams and our partners like poly also have buyback options and they also have upgrade SKUs. right so if you're still buying them and you want to be able to update them in the future you can buy an additional SKU that says, hey, whenever I'm ready, I just call Polycom up and they're going to swap out that BBX phone with the Teams native phone. All right, so we have a question. Who asked that question? It was anonymous. It was anonymous. Yeah. Okay, the question was about our cloud video interop support, and we have plans to extend beyond BlueJeans, Hexip, and Polycom. I no, I'm not aware of any plans to extend beyond those three. Okay. Are you done? I'm done. <laughs> so, Are you done? um. You want to bring your slides back up again? Oh, uh, yeah. So we had a question. Somebody asked if there was an issue, a, a root cause for the lack of audio in the beginning. Had nothing to do with the service. It had to do something with 
my microphone plugging into my PC. And uh, I, I have no idea what that was, but it was not, had nothing to do with Teams. We just switched microphones and we got audio. So that was uh, short and sweet of that. So some next steps, a couple of things uh, we just wanted to quickly highlight. Um, and I guess I'll actually, I'm gonna go over to video for this just because I can and because I'm a ham. So uh, real quickly, a couple of last next steps. Hey. <laughs> and a couple of, like I said, last steps. So number one, if you have ongoing questions, please contact your Microsoft team. They stand ready to help. Like Pete has said, there he is. Hi, Pete. Uh, I'm ready. Right? So, you know, that's all we do is engage with customers, and there are teams throughout the country and worldwide doing that with their customers. Please contact your team. Don't try to go it alone. We want to help. Yes, there are fast track resources, plenty, plenty of stuff online. We're going to provide the recording from today along with some resources on a follow-up. You'll be able to find those at aka.ms slash HLS blog. It's the blog where we posted the links for this particular webcast. So same place, right? So we'll be posting that out there. Also, um, please keep a watch. I would add our blog to your favorite so you can go back there. If you really want to make it impactful and keep up to date, create a channel in a team where you're talking about teams internally and add the RSS feed for our blog. It's, it's available out there. So you can actually have that fed right in there uh, to you to be able to talk about and interact with. Finally, um, we will be putting out an announcement, but next month I got a lot of uh, questions around follow up people wanting to do another step by step. And I actually have a use case. We're going to be uh, doing another step by step broadcast. I haven't decided yet whether I'll do it in one session or two like last time, but we're going to be covering taking a live physical event at an organization and how to really increase the impact and the scale and return on investment of that event. We're going to cover end to end everything from setting up a centralized portal to Yammer sessions that will have video for interactivity uh, for the various session breakouts, people roaming using the mobile client on Android or iOS and taking the entire uh, construct that you create and then publishing that and pushing it right back into Teams on that left-hand side bar. So stay tuned, I'll have an announcement uh, and the links for that uh, probably this week and that will be sometime next month. But with that, um, what do we have? Anything else? I saw one, what room video are you using for this team? Well, I wish I could tell you we were using a Teams room solution. Pete, we don't have one set up here. What we are using, so I have a, here for our solution, what I do have is a Logitech meetup camera. Um, that's all we're using today. And it's a great solution. It's kind of an all-in-one. I tried to use my blue microphone in the beginning, and uh, that was the source of the problem. This was the problem, my... It's not a my old faithful gave out on me. So I've had that thing for years. Um, I guess I'm done with it. So, but yeah, we're just right now using the built-in one off the, the yep. uh, meetup the camera. PCs. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, low budget uh, solution and uh, great budget solution though. Yep. Yeah, and that's it. So just want that out, no other questions. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining again. Mike. Sam. <laughs> Until next time, and you have a great day. Take care as always. Ciao. Have a great day. And that is a wrap.